Okay, hello, how's it going? Um, today, uh, on this live video, I was wanting to pick up on some of the themes that I've been looking at in the previous videos um, and expand on them. So if you've been watching them, great. You get a star in your hymn book. Um, or do you get a star, and if you get enough stars, you get a hymn book. I kind of forget how the whole thing works. But anyway, well done. You get a virtual pat on the back. If you haven't watched them, then that's terrible shame on you. But what we've been doing is I was defining um, something called a circle of reality. A circle of reality is basically a, a ubiquitous way in which we swim in the world, in which we live and have our being. A circle of reality is, in short, uh, a way of thinking about the world where there is who you presently are, where the world presently is and then where you would like to be or where you would like the world to be and the idea of how to get from the is to the ought. It depends, doesn't matter what religion you are, secular, humanist, Christian, Buddhist, Muslim, uh, doesn't matter if you're Republican or Democrat, uh, you'll see that this type of approach to the world uh, you find it everywhere. The is, the ought, and how you get to that. And in the last couple of videos, I was talking about Christianity as a critique of all circles of reality. That, that religion at its core is that which legitimates our worldview and our circles of reality. But there is this radical moment uh, that we read about in Christianity that, that ruptures it. So I want to talk a little bit more about that. It's quite abstract, it's quite deep, so I appreciate you sticking with me on these things. But I want to explain it by actually referencing um, some things I talked about a number of months ago. Uh, if you've watched the video where I talk about desire, you'll remember that I mentioned that desire has two aspects. This is from Lacan. Uh, when you desire something, there's two things going on. Now, we're not really aware of them, but they're there in the background. Uh, the thing that we are aware of is that there's something we desire. It might be a man, it might be a woman, it might be a new car, a new house, it might be a new religion. Whatever it is, there's an object of desire, and we focus on that. But the other thing that's going on that we're not so aware of is the, what's called the object cause of desire. Now the object cause of desire is that thing that gets in the way, that stops you getting what you want. So the gambler, you know, they're trying to win money and the fact that they keep losing uh, is an impediment to what they want to get. Or, you know, you want a successful business but the competition keeps crushing you. Or you want a new car but you can't afford to get it. Right? All of these things that get in the way of what we want. We have the object of desire and we have that which gets in the way of us getting the object of desire. Now in previous live videos, I've talked about how these are actually interconnected. That what we think of as the thing that is stopping us getting what we want is actually what invests the thing that we want with value. So, for example, you might want to climb a mountain. But the fact that you can't do that, at least immediately, that you have to work hard, you have to train, you have to buy equipment, that seems like the, the thing that's getting in the way. But actually, that starts to create extra value in the object of desire. If you could just climb the mountain instantly, it would take the joy out of it. Or for the gambler, if the gambler won every time they played, very quickly they would lose interest in the game, right? And putting 10p into the, into the slot machine, right? That, that actually the thing that gets in the way of what you desire helps to invest that thing with meaning. I don't want to spend too long on that because you can watch previous videos where I, where I go into more detail. But, um, Take the idea of you know, just somebody who um, is wanting to you know, buy a new house. 
and they're always looking through the paper, they're always looking on the internet, they're, they're going and visiting sites. Uh, they think that that is you know, what they have to do before they get the house, that's the thing you have to get out of the way. But actually, that's where a lot of the enjoyment is. Whenever you actually get the house, you no longer are looking for it. And therefore, having the house starts to lose its value. Um, to be human then is to kind of oscillate between depression. You could define depression as not getting what you want, but still wanting it. So you don't have the object of your desire, but you have the object cause of your desire. And melancholy is where you get the object of your desire, but you lose the object cause of desire. You lose the struggle that actually invests that with meaning. Now, the reason why I'm talking about this, and uh, if you listen to the next Robcast where we talk about love, um, you'll hear me talk about this more. But the reason why this is important is, in a sense, we misperceive where pleasure is. We consciously think that what we want is the object of our desires. Whatever they are, we concentrate on that. But actually, unconsciously, what we really want is the object cause of desire. The thing that sparks off our need, the thing that, 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 that causes us to struggle. Now, we don't see that generally. So what does that mean? Well, it sounds counterintuitive initially. But it means that the gambler, for example, isn't addicted to winning. They're actually addicted to losing. Because in losing, the idea of winning gets invested with extra value. The more they lose, the more they fantasize that if only they could you know, crack the game, if only they could win all of that money, then everything would be wonderful. The fact that they never get there, that they're always losing their money, keeps the dream alive that there is something that will satisfy them and it keeps their desire moving. If they won all the time, you know, if you're playing slot machines, maybe you win 10 grand in a year or something, but you're going to lose interest very quickly because all you're getting is flashing lights, standing in a, in a pub and putting coins into a machine. There's better ways to make money. Um, in the same way in relationships, you may have desired your partner, right? You really wanted them, they were the object of your desire. But the object cause was because they were hard to get. You had to woo them, you had to seduce them, you had to win them over. But now you're in the relationship, it's all a bit boring. Desire is dying, you're just kind of friends. Now, what happens often in those types of relationships, which we all know, is that unconsciously, your body, you want struggle. You want desire to be moving again. You're, it's melancholy when you've got what you wanted and it's just a bit boring. So what happens is often you will do something that gets desire moving, but it's usually quite a destructive thing. You might have, somebody might have an affair or they might crash the car or burn down their house by accident, but kind of like an accident that weirdly seems like it was on purpose. Or you take, there was an actress I read about who, you know, very wealthy, who was caught stealing clothes out of a clothes store. And you go, why would she steal clothes? You know, she's got everything she wants. Well, exactly. It's boring. So her unconscious drive is driving her to do something that will destabilize her life and get desire going again to spark off what we really want, which is the struggle. But it's misperceived and therefore it comes out in dangerous ways. People rack up thousands of dollars in debt buying stuff that they don't want. And you go, well, they do want to do that. But maybe they do. Not consciously, but unconsciously, the act is to kind of destabilize your existence, to get desire moving again. Right, all of this to say, this fits within the idea of a circle of reality. There is who we are, and there's you know, what we would want. We have an object, a sacred object, that we really desire. 
And if we don't get it, we're unhappy. If we do get it, we, we fall into melancholy. But there is the where we are, where we'd like to be, and we have all these different ideas of how to get there. Now, what has this got to do with Christianity? Well, this is kind of gets to the core of, you know, in a sense, why I identify with Christianity. Uh, not as a belief system, not as a set of doctrines or um, institutional practices, but rather in the central insight of Christianity, there is this idea that the object of desire is found in the object cause of desire. And what I mean by that is at the time of the Gospels, the whole idea is that God is the object of desire, right? Now, today it might be a million other things, but at that time, God is the object of desire. And Christ was the, was the impossible uh, obstacle that had to be killed in order to get back to God. So Christ was, you had to crucify Christ, a false messiah, um, that disruptor to religion who had to be done away with. And then the, the really interesting thing about the crucifixion is we discover when we read this, this narrative that Christ is not the obstacle to God, but is God, which means you know, take away all of this stuff about God and Christ and all that and go down to the structure. It means that the thing that you want more than everything, the thing that you think will satisfy and make you whole and complete, the sacred object, God, is found in the obstacle to God, is found in the struggle, is found in the very thing that makes getting to what you want impossible. Um, another example of this, uh, is seen in Paul's conversion, right? It, it, which is a replication of this logic. Uh, so Paul, who is Saul at the time, is persecuting a group called the Christians. Now, it doesn't matter that they're Christians. That just happens to be, you know, the Christians. It's like Samaritans. It's not that Jesus loved Samaritans. It was the structural position they had that was important. So for Paul, this little band of people called the Christians, they were the obstacle. They had to be destroyed to get back to the pure religion, which for him was Judaism, which again is just a contingent reality. You could fit any other religion or humanism, or whatever, into that box. But the logic is the same. There is the object of desire. There is the object cause of desire, the, 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 the thing that gets in the way. And Paul has the moment of conversion when he hears a voice saying, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? which means the group that was the kind of the, the problem, the heretics, the ones who were bad, the ones who were in the way, are actually the site of the divine, the site of the absolute. The object cause of desire becomes the object of desire. So at a very fundamental level, Christianity is the existential experience of finding the meaning of life in the lack of meaning, of finding the meaning of life in the struggle of life itself, of finding a certain knowing in the unknowing, a certain satisfaction in dissatisfaction, a certain security in mystery. Obviously the mystics are one of the big examples of this. A, um, a group of people in the early church who enjoyed their unknowing, who enjoyed doubt, complexity, and ambiguity, who embraced that not as something negative, but as something positive. So in this way, the fundamental Christian experience, forget about any sort of beliefs or anything like that, the fundamental Christian experience is when you are freed from some sacred object lying in the future that like promises wholeness and completeness and whatever. And here's a, there's a kind of Coca-Cola here is a good example. This is advertising tries to make Coca-Cola, you can see it, uh, you know, into a type of sacred object. You know, you watch the adverts and it, it, it overvalues this. This is overvalued. Like you drink Coca-Cola and you'll have this incredible life. And of course it doesn't deliver and you keep buying it and it won't deliver. The sacred object over promises and under delivers. But the struggle to get things uh, under promises and over delivers. By that I mean that 
you're in Christianity, you're freed from the object that you think, oh, will make my life wonderful. Just drop the cook. <laughs> okay. um, and you're freed from the object that you think will make life wonderful. You embrace the struggle of life and you go, this is where I am in the midst of the difficulties and I embrace that fully. And then you affirm that and you find joy in it. And in that, uh, you break a circle of reality because you have a new form of temporality. You enter into a new form of existence where you're outside of a temporality where you're unhappy until you get the thing that will make you happy and you're always trying to get there. And now you, you be. You go, I find satisfaction and dissatisfaction and in the struggle of life. You still fight for things and move forward, but not with a sacred object. A great example of sports, uh, if your football team keeps winning, it actually takes the joy out of things. In fact, Todd McGowan in his book, Capitalism and Desire, says you know, even if your team wins everything, you you're start to wait about to the next game where they might lose. You have to have this idea of loss built in. And actually the enjoyment is being with your team through thick and thin and the winning and the losing. Uh, when I was talking to Rob today, we talked about writing. I said, like, maybe, you know, if I say I have a desire to have a number one bestseller, that's the object of desire. The object cause of desire, the impossibility is I have to sit down and write the book. I have to sweat over the right way to phrase something, to find the rhythm and the beat of, mu of, the, of the words so they're like music, so it's lyrical, so that it takes you on a journey. And I have to work really hard to craft that and then work with publishers and all that work. But if I think that that's the tough thing I want to get over to get the number one bestseller, I am misperceiving where the pleasure is. Because the day that you get the number one bestseller, you know, it might be like your football team winning, it's kind of cool, but that's not where the real enjoyment is. It was actually in the crafting of the work itself, the struggle itself. And if we don't correctly perceive where the pleasure is, and we falsely imagine that the pleasure is in the sacred object, then getting the sacred object gets rid of the object cause of desire, the impossibility of struggle, gets rid of that. And then your body attempts to spark off again by potentially doing destructive things, things that will hurt you, things that will hurt your family, things that will hurt your friends, in a frantic, in a frantic attempt to rekindle the struggle and the need and the desire. But the fundamental Christian experience is the correct perception, not intellectually, but existentially, the embrace of doubt, complexity, unknowing, struggle, um, the, the, the affirming that, the trusting of that, the finding pleasure in that, basically wanting want itself. You learn to want want, to enjoy need. And that has a lot of connotations for how relationships look, how political movements look, how, how religious movements look. Uh, for example, that means that the role of the church is not to promise satisfaction and completion and all of that stuff, but rather to draw people into an enjoyment of the unknown. And you know, the scientific endeavor is a perfect example of this. You know, good scientists uh, aren't driven by answers. We think they are, just like we think that the gambler is driven by wanting to win. That's our common sense idea. But no, the scientist is driven by failure to get an answer. They're, they come back continually to test and to research. And when they actually discover something that seems pretty solid, well, they very quickly move on to the next question because what's animating their desire is the struggle itself. The worst thing that could happen would be a theory of everything that meant that we just have to pack up and, and that's it. That's the, that's the scientific endeavor over. We've explained it all. But the fact that, that there is this perpetual... Um, postponement of the end uh, is, is actually where the enjoyment is. Um, and in short, what we need to do 
and it's very hard to do, and I'm not even, you know, we're not talking about how you do it at points of theory, is correctly perceive that the struggle is itself the site of enjoyment in life. Um, and that we think that while that, that under promises, it actually is very, very enriching, while the sacred object over promises and is ultimately weak and impotent and nothing. Okay, there's some thoughts. Uh, let me have a little look, see if anyone's saying hi. Oh, uh, there's a question. Is this how we stop self-sabotaging, trusting in the dissatisfaction? Yes, the reason why I'm saying this, the key point of this kind of abstract live video is that if you get what you want, right, and you get a relationship, you, get, you settle down, you do all of that, what happens weirdly is that you enter into melancholy and you're likely to do something destructive. Your body, because in a sense, you're, happy, you know, you're in your consciousness saying, oh, I got everything I wanted, but your body is dying. It has to spark off the desire, so you will self-sabotage. You will say something terrible to your friend. As I say, you'll crash the car by accident, you know, reverse into the wall, and you'll go, oh, why did I do that? Well, you did it because you wanted disruption not always sometimes a cigar is just a cigar but but you see it often is that you know someone racks up twenty thousand dollars in debt someone starts stealing things from a shop that they don't need um, uh, you know having having affairs emotional or sexual affairs all of this stuff seems to be the very thing that we think we don't want but it's actually what we do want so the way to stop self-sabotaging in a sense is to try to have the insight that we do want struggle. So for example, you might go, okay, let's, uh, I say this at the raw, in the raw cast, but you know, let's start a small business together. I always wanted to kind of like create something or let's sell the house and you know, travel around the world or whatever. And what, in other words, you find a healthy way of disrupting your life because otherwise an unhealthy way of disruption will arise. But the key is not to create a new disruption that has a new sacred object. Oh yeah, we travel around the world and then we'll be whole and complete. Oh, we'll set up a business and then everything will be wonderful. You, you simply try in your relationship in multiple ways to bring a healthy form of dissatisfaction into the environment because the healthy form of dissatisfaction will be satisfying uh, rather than the, uh, the unhealthy version. Uh, let's see. I was safe to say, yeah, self-sabotage has seen profoundly in Dostoevsky's Underground Man. Yes, Dostoevsky, the Russian authors like Dostoevsky and Tolstoy are incredible at, at seeing, at, at having insights into the human psyche. <laughs> um, incredible. All right. Lots of people checking in from all over the place. Oklahoma, Chicago, I'm going to be in Oklahoma very soon. Uh, Chicago, Memphis, uh, Toledo, Ohio, yeah, to Dallas, Texas, lots of people. All right, anyway, let me see if I can find one more question and then I'll go. Sometimes it takes a few minutes for the questions to come up, so by the time I click off, then I suddenly see all these really good questions. Um, oh yeah, well, so I'll do the last one. Robin just came up saying, should we set goals? Um, this is interesting, Rob, because in a sense, this is, I don't want to say that there's, you know, you, you shouldn't set goals or anything like that, but they become fundamentally different once you break this circle of reality. Um, you kind of realize that, that the aim, there's the goal, and then there's the aim, the movement towards the goal. And it's realizing that the movement towards the goal is where, you know, a lot of the pleasure and enjoyment is. And the goal itself, uh, we have to find a way of kind of revolving around the, the goals we set. So like, to, for example, when you love someone, um, you kind of, you want to have that insight that loving someone and knowing someone means that you know that you don't know them, that they are an enigma to you and to themselves, that there's so much more of them to discover, that there'll always be a struggle in relationship to get to know them better, to, to work out kind of, uh, you know, kind of 
like all the stuff that goes on in the relationship you have to work out how to 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 um overcome arguments and uh you know kind of live into the future and all of those struggles in a sense they're hard baked in that you get rid of the idea that there's a final goal that there's a, there's a there's an ultimate end and you enjoy kind of like the perpetual failure <laughs> to reach your goals uh but in that perpetual f- failure uh, you you move forward and, uh, you know, it's kind of positive. Anyway, I hope uh, you got something out of my rambling thoughts. Uh, as always, if you want to get a lot more and go a lot deeper, you can join parotheology.com where I give out, uh, you know, weekly reflections, written reflections, monthly lectures. I'm actually live uh, sharing my upcoming book like once every week to 10 days i put another little bit of the book out um you know for people to read uh because it'll take a year before it's probably out um so if you if you want more you go to paratheology.com but there's plenty of free stuff that you know, you can probably listen to you know two days of me talking just on these live videos um, there's lots of stuff on my youtube channel as well so enjoy that and um i'll check in with you in a few days thanks for Thanks for coming in. Um, Have a great night and uh, I'll talk to you all again soon.